Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Robert Brown, organizer of the college's History, Culture, and Diversity series. And I want to thank everybody for turning out today to commemorate Women's History Month. This is, as you know, our annual opportunity to celebrate the vital role that women have played in shaping our national history and the occasion to acknowledge their outstanding contributions, often in the face of great challenges and formidable obstacles. Today, we highlight a remarkable and inspiring story of two pioneering women with a significant local history connection. We're also live on Finger Lakes Television right now, which is Spectrum Cable Channel 1304, and online at fingerlakestv.org and Facebook. And we'll be recording today's presentation as we do for the benefit of those who can't join us today. So if you could please be sure to mute your microphones until the latter portion of the presentation when we'll have a dedicated Q&A uh, section. That would, that would be perfect and appreciated. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce scholar and author Janice P. Nomura, who will speak on the subject of her New York Times bestselling work, The Doctors Blackwell, How Two Pioneering Sisters Brought Medicine to Women and Women to Medicine. Great title, I love that. This book garnered a national endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar Award, a New York Times Editor's Choice Award, and if that's not prestigious enough, she, this book was also a finalist for the 2022 Pulitzer Prize bi in Biography. Doctors Blackwell was also selected as one of the Kirkus Review's four books to read for Women's History Month. So I guess we selected appropriately here. Miss Namira earned her bachelor's in English from Yale and an MA in East Asian Studies from Columbia University. Her previous book, Daughters of the Samurai, a Journey from East to West and Back was selected as a New York Times notable book in 19, uh, sorry, 2015. Her essays and book reviews have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and Smithsonian Magazine. And she has contributed to an array of on-air interviews and podcasts for the London Times, the BBC, NPR, and other media. Without further ado, please welcome our distinguished author and presenter, Ms. Janice P. Nimura. Thank you so much, Professor Brown. Um, let me just do the housekeeping part of sharing my screen because this is a much better story with pictures. There it is. Um, hold up. Sorry. Um, one second. All right, there we go. Um, everybody can see that okay, Dr. Brown? We're good mm -hmm. on that? Thank you so much for having me. And I, as, as, as Dr. Brown mentioned, um, this is a, a, a story with local um, color. Um, it's a real pleasure to kick off my Women's History Month um, telling this story where it, it, partly where it, where it was born. Um, so the Finger Lakes are, are have a big part in the story. Um, so if you um, are familiar with the name Blackwell at all, and many people aren't, um, it's probably just Elizabeth Blackwell, uh, usually followed in your mind by the phrase first woman doctor. She was the first woman in America to receive a medical degree in 1849. Uh, her sister Emily followed her to become the third woman um, in 1854 to receive a medical degree, and together they founded the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children, and then the Women's Medical College of the New York Infirmary. So I encountered the Blackwell story in 2015. Um, this despite the fact, that was the first time I'd ever heard of the Blackwells. Uh, and this despite the fact that I had grown up in New York City where they practiced, I went to a proudly feminist all girls school from the age of five through graduation. I was the math science kid there. Um, I entered college intending to pursue medicine. How was it possible I had never heard of them? Um, so 
I went looking for them and I discovered that the Blackwell story tends to be easiest to find on the children's biography shelf at the library. Um, if you head to the library, you'll see several versions of it usually. Um, this is a chapter book version from the 1940s. Um, they all have certain similarities. The illustrations always feature a slim, attractive young woman, well-dressed with a stethoscope, um, bending solicitously over a grateful patient. So 1940s chapter version, here's the modern middle grade version. Uh, this was from my daughter's school library way back when. Uh, again, nice clothes, stethoscope, grateful patient. Um, here's the picture book version, slightly younger and perkier version of Elizabeth with little hair ties. But there's the stethoscope in the bag waiting for her to grow up. Um, these books um, no, o o always and only featured Elizabeth. If Emily was mentioned at all, it was only in passing. Um, and they seemed sanitized to me. They All the contradictions were sort of polished away. There's nothing wrong with them, but they seemed incomplete. And as I began to follow Elizabeth and Emily's voices and, um, and writings into the archives, I discovered that um, they were not uncomplicated women. Um, they were not the kind of um, Disney level feminist icons that I think a lot of people would like them to be. Um, they were much more complicated than that. And I became really interested in telling the story of both of them with all of the ragged edges intact. So what is that story? Briefly, um, eight out of the nine Blackwell siblings were born in Bristol, England. They came to America as children in 1832. Uh, they were the sons and daughters of a man who was something of a paradox. He had made his fortune in the sugar refining industry. Bristol was a sugar capital and therefore also um, deeply in, involved in the triangle trade of the Atlantic world, which involved enslaved labor. Um, uh, Samuel Blackwell, the patriarch, uh, spent all of his free time ardently involved in the abolitionist movement. Think about that for a second. Um, he was a man who thought in an unorthodox way. He was interested in sanitizing the moral hygiene of his own industry. Um, he raised his children in an unorthodox way. They were dissenters from the Church of England. Uh, the boys and the girls received the same level of education, which was extremely rare in the early 19th century. Um, and their dreamer father, uh, on the strength of his of his impulse to fix uh, the, the the cruelty and inhumanity of his industry, uh, moved his family to the New World uh, in search of a way to make sugar out of sugar beets that could be grown in the North without enslaved labor. Um, he moved them in 1832 to New York, and then eventually to the um, edge of the known universe in America, which at that point in 1838 was Cincinnati, um, the, the, the frontier where he was looking for more space to grow sugar beets. Um, he got them all the way out to Cincinnati, uh, now nine Blackwell siblings because George Washington Blackwell, the ninth of them had been born in New York. Um, he got them all the way out to Cincinnati and then he died leaving them with about $20 um, and left his daughters with a very clear sense that having a husband is no guarantee of security. None of his five daughters ever married. So now you have nine Blackwell siblings um, orphaned on the edge of the known universe. Uh, and at this point, they really become a tribe. They uh, are also become a great gift to a biographer because they feel other to everyone except each other. They're very closely bonded and also, like many siblings, they kind of drive each other a little nuts. So for the rest of their lives, they are constantly leaving each other and writing to each other, all nine of them, um, which creates this multi-layered, multi-voiced record of an extraordinary family. Um, um, sorry, I skipped something there. Um, uh, th just in case you are uh, interested in Victorian archival research. This is often what early Victorian letters look like. Um, paper and postage was quite expensive. So you did something called cross writing. You filled the page, then you rotated it 90 degrees and you filled it again. Sometimes you flipped it over and did the same thing on the back. This is a letter from Henry Blackwell to his big sister Elizabeth in 1844. It's actually an exquisite example of cross writing. Henry has beautiful handwriting. Um, 
but it can be a little eye popping. Um, some people, I think this is cool as heck. Uh, a lot of people would run screaming from it. Um, so Elizabeth was born in 1821. Uh, she was voraciously brilliant, socially quite awkward, um, blessed with a healthy sense of her own self-worth. She admired the transcendentalist writer and editor, Margaret Fuller, who you may have heard of. Um, Margaret Fuller, at this point in the mid 19th century, it's now about eight, eight, 1844 or so, Elizabeth Blackwell's in her mid twenties. Margaret Fuller was the author of a bestseller at this point that would have been part of the Blackwell Library a book called Woman in the 19th Century. And in that book, Margaret Fuller had argued that humanity would not rise to a new level of enlightenment until women unleashed their own power and proved that they could do anything men can do. That it was not it had nothing to do with sex, it had everything to do with talent and effort. Uh, women could be sea captains, said Margaret Fuller, and humanity was not going to advance to its ideal level until women proved that they could. Um, and Elizabeth, as I mentioned, had a healthy ego and began to think of herself as someone who might help to prove Margaret Fuller's point and thereby help to lead humanity higher. Um, so how to do that? She chose medicine um, and it was an odd choice for Elizabeth Blackwell. Elizabeth Blackwell liked to read history and philosophy and literature. Um, she did not love science. She did not feel called to heal the sick. Um, she thought sickness was a sign of weakness. She thought bodily functions were disgusting. But medicine in this moment was an unusually clear way to prove the point she wanted to make. Um, medicine was redefining itself in the mid 19th century, both scientifically and institutionally. Um, to this point, it had been considered more of a trade. Uh, the trade of midwives and barber surgeons. Um, now, increasingly, it was a profession. It was a profession of men, um, men who were legitimate by virtue of having gone to a medical school and received a medical diploma. Um, so Elizabeth Blackwell thought to herself, um, if I can find my way to a medical school and sit through all the lectures and pass all the examinations and receive a diploma, who can argue that I am any less qualified to be a doctor than a man? Um, and she knew, as this cartoon from 1825 suggests, that medical school in this moment was not much of an intellectual challenge the way it is today. Um, at, in the 1840s, medicine is what you studied if you weren't clever enough for uh, the law or divinity school. Um, it, it was, nowhere near as rigorous a training as, as medical school is now. Um, medical school consisted of two consecutive 16 week terms of lectures. Um, that's right, ex exactly the same one year after the next. You sat through 16 weeks of lectures, you went away to get some apprenticeship time over the summer, you came back, you did another 16 weeks of lectures. Um, if you were lucky, your medical school had um, a, a, a dissecting room where you could actually um, do some dissection and learn about anatomy. A lot of medical students graduated from medical school without ever having touched a living patient. Um, so Elizabeth was pretty sure, given her own prodigious, prodigious intellect, that if she could find her way to a medical school, she would have very little trouble finding her way through a medical school. So at the age of 26, um, Elizabeth won admission. Sorry, there seems to be. Okay. Um, um, Elizabeth won admission. Sorry, why is this? Um, Dr. Brown, I, somebody was asking to annotate the lecture, and I'm not sure why my slides no longer advance. Cheryl, do you have the answer to that? Um, no, but I see someone trying to annotate it. Is there a way you can? Ah, there we go. There you I'm go. Just... Sorry about that. Back to our regularly scheduled, regularly scheduled programming. Okay, so um, she won admission to a tiny rural medical school in Geneva, New York. Now this audience knows that better than most. Um, Geneva College has since evolved into Hobart and William Smith Colleges. Um, the medical college uh, once looked on the left, that building is no longer there and has been replaced by the plaque that you see on the right. Um, the story of her admission is an interesting 
um, detour into what it feels like to try to write biography. Um, if you read Elizabeth Blackwell's memoir, which was written 50 years later, um, the story of her admission goes something like, um, uh, I was roundly rejected. People laughed at me for wanting to go to medical school. Um, uh, going to medical school as a woman was, was outrageous. Um, uh, it was unladylike. How could I want to sit in a medical school auditorium and learn about the intimate processes of the human body among a room full of men? Um, but I persevered and after a sheaf of rejections, I uh, received this admission letter, um, never having doubted that I would be successful, and off I went. Um, the actual story, uh, which is interestingly included in her memoir in an appendix at the back, is told by one of her classmates, a man named Dr. Stephen Smith, who uh, went on to become a very prominent New York City physician, but at this point was, you know, a, a provincial um, boy from rural New York in the medical school class of rowdy school boys. He told a very different story of her admission. Um, the story that he told was that one day into the medical lecture room at Geneva College walked a professor with a letter. And the letter was a request from a rather prestigious physician in Philadelphia to allow Elizabeth Blackwell to come and study with them. Um, the professors at Geneva College weren't quite bold enough to just reject this request out of hand, um, but they really didn't want a woman studying among them. Um, so they brought the letter to the students, this rowdy bunch of boys, and said, okay, guys, um, you're going to vote on whether this woman will join us. They thought they were safe. Um, they, they figured the boys will vote it down and that'll be that. Um, the students, seeing that this was an opportunity to make some serious mischief um, and not having much respect for the professors that had uh, punted the question in the first place, called a meeting that night, um, basically bludgeoned into submission anybody who disagreed with them uh, about admitting this woman and returned a triumphant unanimous yes to the faculty the next day, um, suspecting that they were being played a prank by a neighboring medical school, maybe in Syracuse. They thought it was a joke. They couldn't believe that this was really happening. Um, and then they forgot about it until a few weeks later when Elizabeth Blackwell walked into the classroom. Um, once admitted, she really started to warm to the idea of medicine as a pursuit worthy of her intellect. Um, she uh, you know, was finally learning from professors rather than just reading books. She was getting to dissect. Um, she really warmed to her subject and the students really began to realize that if they wanted to do well at medical school, it would probably be a good idea to sit next to Elizabeth Blackwell because she was operating at a level of talent and determination that was far beyond theirs. Her notes looked a lot better than theirs. Um, so it started to go quite well. In between terms, she had to find something to do. And she went back to Philadelphia where she had been studying um, and found her way here to Blockley Almshouse, which was the largest municipal hospital in America at that point. Um, i pause here to explain that when we hear the word hospital, we think of it as a place to get better, to heal ourselves. Um, hospital in the 1840s did not carry that meaning. Um, if you had any money at all, the doctor would come to you in your home and take care of you there. Um, if you had to find your way to a hospital, it meant that you had nowhere else to go. Hospitals were warehouses for the destitute. Um, Elizabeth found her way here and took lodgings in a room off the female syphilis ward. So there was really no practical experience. She suddenly had more than she could handle. Um, it was her first introduction to connections between poverty and public health, um, to the plight of women and venereal disease. Um, the other thing that was happening in this summer of 1848 now um, was uh, waves of refugees arriving from famine-stricken Ireland and from war-ravaged continental Europe um, these refugees were pouring into American ports, carrying epidemic diseases, including typhus, which was known then as ship fever. Uh, typhus patients overflowed the beds at Blockley, um, overflowed onto the pallets on the floor. Um, Elizabeth ended up writing her thesis uh, for Geneva Medical College on, on ship fever. Um, 
an interesting gender neutral choice. She was not gonna write about obstetrics. She was gonna write about something that had nothing to do with the fact that she was a woman. Um, but it was another indication of her orientation toward public health. Um, her thesis was published as the lead article in the Buffalo Medical Journal uh, upon her graduation from Geneva in January, 1849. Uh, as you can see, she didn't just make it through uh, medical school. She sort of blazed through it like a comet. Um, upon graduating at the top of the class, um, she needed some practical training. So she did what a lot of American medical students did in the 19th century um, to get a little extra polish. She went to Europe. Um, the, the capitals of medical education were in Europe and the, the, the best of them all was Paris. So she decided she would go to Paris. Uh, where the medical education was state-sponsored, where there was a lot of education at the bedside. Um, she thought all the medical lectures would be free. It would be terrific. She would go and, and just and learn everything that she had not yet learned. Um, she ignored the warnings from some of her professors that it might be hard to do this as a woman, um, but she said, I'm not going to disguise myself as a man. The whole point is to prove that a woman can be a doctor. Doing it in drag uh, kind of misses the point. Um, so she goes off to Paris and quickly discovers that her professors were right. She can't get into any of the lectures unless she wants to disguise herself and she refuses to. So she finds her way here to La Maternité, a municipal obstetric hospital, a training hospital for young women from all over France who want to become midwives. They come here, they stay in dormitories, they train to become midwives, and then they go back to the provinces. It's housed in an old convent that's still there. I got to go explore and take this picture. Um, uh, Elizabeth Blackwell is in her late 20s. She already has a medical degree. Uh, the women who are studying here are young girls from the provinces with no education, um, and they're just studying to be midwives. So it's a little bit beneath her training, but she realizes that only here will she have access to um, the volume of practical experience, the cases, thousands of women coming through. And again, if you were coming to a hospital like this to deliver a baby, it meant that you had nowhere else to go. Um, so again, this is furthering her education in public health, in the connections between poverty and disease. And it's here that she undergoes a crisis that changes the shape of her career, if not perhaps its direction. Um, a lot of the women delivering here would have been uh, prostitutes infected with venereal diseases. And if a, an infant is born to a woman with gonorrhea, um, they can contract an infection in the birth canal that affects their eyes. It's called gonorrheal conjunctivitis. And Elizabeth Blackwell was tending to one of these infants in the labor and delivery ward early one morning and trying to clean its infected eye when some of the washing liquid splashed up into her face. And she contracted gonorrheal conjunctivitis. Um, from being a, a, a practitioner in this hospital, she suddenly found herself a patient confined to bed. Um, and this is another good moment where you see a story told in a couple of ways and you have to decide how you want to incorporate it. Um, she had befriended her colleague, the wonderfully named Dr. Hippolyte Bleu, uh, who was an attending physician at La Maternité and had taught her a great deal. Now she found herself as his patient. Um, and medicine in the mid 19th century, this is pre-germ theory, pre-antibiotics, pre-penicillin, pre-anything that was particularly useful for healing. Um, medicine was faintly horrifying. So if you, like Elizabeth, suddenly had an infection, you found yourself being subjected to things like bleeding, leeches, uh, opium, uh, mercury, blistering, um, all the horrible horrors of the 19th century uh, medical pharmacopoeia. Um, and without anything useful to use, she was found herself threatened with the loss of her own vision. So Dr. Blow attended to her night and day to see if they could save her sight. Um, this is how she wrote about this episode in, again, in her memoir, 50 years later. She wrote, ah, how dreadful it was to find the daylight gradually fading as my kind doctor bent over me and removed with an exquisite delicacy of touch the films that had formed over the pupil. I could see him for a moment clearly, but the sight soon vanished and the eye was left in darkness. Sounds like a romance novel, right? And Dr. Blow kind of looks like a leading man. Um, 
Fortunately for Elizabeth, at the same time that she is undergoing this ordeal, her oldest sister, Anna Blackwell, happened to be in Paris. Um, Anna Blackwell was a journalist, um, something of a hypochondriac, and as this photograph, I think, wonderfully conveys, a bit of a drama queen. Um, and she rushed to Elizabeth's bedside trying to help, and in the evenings back at her lodgings, she would she wrote long letters back to the home folks in Cincinnati. Um, and what she wrote sounded like this. The pupil presents just now the appearance of one of those little misshapen blackberries of three granulations and half dried up that one sees so often on some scrubby little bush. If you can fancy one such in dull looking lead, then you have just the appearance of this poor eye. Um, a very different account. And it's this kind of work that I love, the, the finding of different versions of the same story and um, using them to get yourself towards something that feels like a truer version of the story. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell eventually lost the use of one eye and was fitted for a glass eye, which she wore for the rest of her life. Um, if you squint hard at this portrait, you can see that there's a slight asymmetry in her gaze, but it's hard to tell. Um, many people in her life never knew that she only had one eye, um, but it changed what the scope of possibility for her as a doctor. Surgery was no longer uh, an option for her. Even reading and writing could be exhausting um, with, the, with the eye that she had remaining. So it pointed her even more firmly toward public health, toward thinking and writing and speaking about health rather than actually being a practitioner. Um, did she go home to recover and get used to her prosthetic eye back in Cincinnati? No, she went on from Paris to London to continue her training. She ended up at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, another public hospital, um, and in London, she made a fateful acquaintance. Um, mutual friends introduced her to a young woman named Florence Nightingale, who you may have heard of. But in 1851, no one had heard of Florence Nightingale. Um, at this point, she was a young, wealthy woman whose family was very eager for her to settle down uh, and get married. Florence Nightingale had no intention of getting married. She had big dreams of making a difference in public health, in hygiene, in, in, in ministering to people who needed her. Um, and I like to imagine, and I don't think it's far off, that her encounter with Elizabeth Blackwell in, at this moment in her life was something of a catalyst. Here's Elizabeth Blackwell with a medical degree and no thoughts of getting married, um, far from her family, roving all over Europe, getting medical experience, Elizabeth is proof that what Florence Nightingale dreams of might be possible. And they become fast friends. Uh, they take long walks together. They discuss what any two young women, women would discuss, um, hospital administration, um, hygiene, ideas that they share. Uh, although they soon realize that there's one fundamental idea that they don't share, which is that Florence Nightingale believes women in health should be nurses. And Elizabeth has staked her life on the idea that a woman can be a doctor. This is a tension that will always exist between them, um, but they will stay in touch for the rest of their lives. Um, finishing her training in England, Elizabeth decides that she is going to return to New York to start her practice. And it's gonna be terrific because of course, women will want to seek the attentions of a female doctor. There are plenty of women in the 1850s who die of cancer because they are mortified at the idea of explaining issues with their reproductive systems to a male doctor. So of course, right? Of course, women will flock to her because they can finally confide their ailments to a fellow woman. Well, she gets back to New York, she hangs out a shingle and nobody comes, why not? Well, because in 1852, the very phrase female physician is a problem. Female physician then did not mean bright young woman with a medical degree. It meant someone like this, Madame Restel, the notorious Fifth Avenue abortionist, uh, pictured here in the National Police Gazette as a baby eating demon. Um, female physician meant someone in the shadows doing something outside of the law. A nice women did not visit female physicians, or if they did, they didn't talk about it. Um, 
And Elizabeth, after all of this triumphant training and all of the success, suddenly finds herself alone in New York and becalmed and dismayed. What has all of this been for? What is the way forward? Um, so meanwhile, she has anointed her sister, Emily, who's five years younger and the most brilliant of her sisters, to follow her into medicine. Elizabeth realizes that being a woman doctor is going to be a steep and lonely path, and she wants someone along with her. Um, she respects her own sisters far more than she respects most other women. Um, Emily actually is more naturally inclined toward medicine. She likes science and botany. Um, she's quite used to listening to her rather um, strong-minded older sisters. And she says, okay, I, I take up this challenge. I, uh, I, will, I will pursue medicine. You would think that being the second Blackwell sister to pursue a medical degree, she would have had an easier time, but unfortunately you would be wrong. Um, no medical schools wanted her, not even Geneva College, who at this point um, had had one experience with a woman among the students, and that was plenty, thank you. Um, complicating the situation was the fact that in the last three or four years, a couple of women's medical colleges had opened, one in Boston and one in Philadelphia, um, to serve the slowly growing numbers of women who were interested in pursuing medicine. And so the men's medical colleges just said, Emily Blackwell, why wouldn't you go to one of the women's colleges? Those are for you. You don't need to come here. We don't need to have you. Um, but Emily, I think, being both ambitious and a little competitive, was not going to settle for a degree that was less prestigious than what her sister had found. So she went to, she started out at Rush University in Chicago, had an excellent and successful first year of medical school there, upon which the trustees of Rush got cold feet and asked her not to return for her second term. Um, she was undaunted, pivoted to Cleveland Medical College, which has since evolved into Case Western, and finished her degree there in 1854. Uh, and now, like Elizabeth, she needed some practical instruction, some practical experience, and she too decided to go to Europe to find it. I think rather pointedly not going to either Paris or London, she went to the third wonderful medical education capital of Europe, which was Edinburgh. And there she attached herself to a man named James Young Simpson, who at that point was one of the most prominent physicians in Britain. He was by appointment to the queen. He was the professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Edinburgh. Um, he was the man who in uh, 1847, I believe, had discovered the anesthetic properties of chloroform. And the story went that he had discovered them by passing a decanter of chloroform around at his dining table, whereupon all of his dinner guests burst into hysterical laughter and then passed out under the table. Um, he, was, he was a bit of a showman. He was kind of a larger than life figure. And I think he liked the shock value of having a female among his assistants. The story went that he liked to call into the next room, Dr. Blackwell, could you come here for a second? And then a woman would walk in and everybody would gape. Um, at the same time, he taught her a great deal at the cutting edge of, of obstetrics and gynecology. He, he was an innovator himself. Um, he was a pioneer of the pelvic exam, something that in, at first startled Emily, but then she discovered what kind of diagnostic power it had. Um, he taught her about instruments like these, um, a pessary, which would have been used in cases of uterine prolapse, um, a uterine sound that he had invented, a kind of calibrated probe to measure the dimensions of the cervix. Um, she is writing about all this, home in letters to Elizabeth, who, as I mentioned, is now becalmed in New York with not, a, not enough to do and no money coming in. Emily has suddenly become the instructor in the relationship. Um, you can see her sketches of those instruments, right? On the left side of this letter, she's teaching Emily what she's learning. Um, from the beginning, I was determined that this book would be a book about both Blackwell sisters, because I firmly believe that the story doesn't work with only one of them. Um, but the fact is that there is more information about Elizabeth. She wrote more, she published more, more was written about her, more of her letters were preserved. So what do you do when you want to write a double portrait, but you don't have a, a, a balanced amount of source material? Um, one of the things you can do is one of my favorite things to do, which is to get out of the archives and start following your, your subjects around, which is what I did. I went to Edinburgh with all of Emily's letters and started following in her footsteps. 
um, to say this address, 52 Queen Street, which was Simpson's residence, the only building in the row with an extra story because his practice and his family and his social life were bursting at the seams. Uh, it's still there. Uh, the day that I walked by to take this picture, I sort of tree traced Emily's steps from her lodgings to here where she would have come every day. And when I got here, the door was open. And so in the spirit of following in the footsteps, I walked in. Um, it's it's a drug counseling center now. It's not a private home, so I wasn't totally trespassing. Um, but even in that brief um, wander inside until they asked me to wander out again, um, you can see things that teach you about how it felt to be your subject. So things like the back staircase where James Young Simpson's Latinized initials IYS are worked into the banister. Um, this would have been the stairs that Emily walked up each day on her on her way to his consulting rooms. Um, tells you something about what she did and it tells you something about him because what kind of guy puts his initials in his own banister? Um, I went to the Museum of the Royal College of Surgeons, which I highly recommend if you're into medical history, and I think some of you might be, um, in Edinburgh. Uh, they wouldn't let me take pictures there, but I had my sketchbook. So a few things in among their artifacts were things like on the left there, James Young Simpson's pocket pill case with compartments in it for things like opium and mercury and a little message under the lid that said, please return to 52 Queen Street. Um, they had his monaural stethoscopes down there on the left. Stethoscopes actually didn't look the way we think of stethoscopes. All those picture book pictures were inaccurate. Um, they were more like ear trumpets um, in ivory and rosewood. I like to imagine that maybe even Emily had used one of those monaural stethoscopes in Simpson's examining rooms. They even had the decanter that uh, he was said to have passed the chloroform around in. So a fun way to get inside the, the, the lived reality of your, of your subject. Um, unfortunately, uh, none of this success uh, that Emily was experiencing with Simpson was enough to protect her from the snarkiness of the media. Um, she, she came in for some of the same mockery that Elizabeth had come in for. This is a cartoon from the London satiric newspaper Punch, from 1856 while Emily was in Edinburgh, it's meant to show Emily um, in the outrageous bloomer costume of the women's rights activists, which she was not, in, incidentally, she, she did not consider herself a women's rights advocate, which is another complicating part of this story. Um, anyway, with a rather mannish profile and spectacles and a ridiculous hat, squinting diagnostically at the only patient who would consult a woman doctor, a lapdog being clutched in the arms of a more conventionally feminine maiden. Um, happily, both Emily and Elizabeth were very good at ignoring this kind of silliness. So now Emily has finished her training, and finally, she is going to converge with her sister in New York. And together, in 1857, they found the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children in a building that still stands, if you ever come down to Manhattan, um, on the corner of Bleecker and Crosby Streets in Greenwich Village. Um, on the left as it was, on the right as it is. Um, this was a pioneering hospital in many ways. It was the first hospital to be staffed by women. Um, the intention was not just to give the poor women of the surrounding tenement neighborhoods um, an opportunity to seek free care at the, at the hands of female physicians. It was also to create a place for the slowing, slowly growing number of female medical graduates to have a place to get training without having to go to Europe the way the Blackwells had. Um, I uh, happened to befriend the woman who makes her headquarters in this building and when she was renovating it rather lovingly. And so I got to get inside the building and see the original hearths and the sash windows and uh, get more of a feeling of being close to the ghosts. I actually wrote the chapter about the infirmary inside the building, which was a great privilege. Um, as you might expect uh, from women who founded a hospital in 1857, the Blackwells had a role to play uh, at the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861. Um, in 1861, when, when the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter, um, they gathered their friends and supporters in their own living room and drafted this appeal to run in the New York Times, an appeal to the women of New York and especially to those already engaged in preparing against the time of wounds and sickness in the army. There was a great deal of unfocused chaotic energy among the women of New York 
for the union cause, um, it needed some channeling and some organizing. Um, and in response to this appeal the next day um, at the Cooper Institute, another building that still stands, thousands of women gathered uh, to, uh, in a general meeting out of which grew an organization called the Women's Central Association of Relief. Um, this later evolved into the US Sanitary Commission. So you can kind of draw a straight line uh, from the Blackwell's living room to the most important civilian organization of the Civil War. Um, the Blackwell sisters, uh, understandably, were put in charge of the committee that was going to uh, identify and train and deploy nurses to the front. And for a while, Elizabeth and Emily dove into this work with great enthusiasm because it really felt like uh, the achievement of Margaret Fuller's idea. Here they are standing shoulder to shoulder with men in the service of a noble cause, um, really doing important work as physicians. Um, that feeling unfortunately didn't last. Um, it, it turned out that the male physicians in New York weren't really ready to stand shoulder to shoulder with female physicians. Um, the lead leadership role in Washington, D.C. went not to one of the Blackwells, but to this woman, Dorothea Dix, uh, who had no medical training. She was a skilled lobbyist, but um, Elizabeth Blackwell called her the meddler in chief and had no respect for her. Um, eventually, Elizabeth and Emily uh, became frustrated. Their own hospital was left off the list of institutions that would help with the training of the nurses they were identifying. Um, they really felt frustrated and disrespected. And eventually they withdrew their support from the war effort and turned their attention to their next joint, next and, and, and final joint project, which was the foundation of the Women's Medical College of the New York Infirmary in 1869. Um, now this is a bit ironic. Elizabeth and Emily had demanded to to study medicine alongside men. And they had assumed that their example would have integrated um, would have made medical schools co-educational. They had proved that women could study alongside men, but instead women's medical colleges had opened. And these women's medical colleges uh, in their minds were profoundly inferior. They just weren't training women at the same level that the men's colleges were. And they knew this because the graduates of these women's medical colleges were ending up at their own infirmary for further training and they just weren't that well educated. Um, so. In, a, in the spirit of if you can't beat them, join them, um, the Blackwells changed their minds about single sex medical education and founded a women's medical college of their own at a level of rigor that was at least as high as the men's medical colleges, if not higher. They instituted a number of, of really striking innovations. Their college was three years, not two. It did not repeat its lectures one year after the next, but built on them. Um, it used its own infirmary as an opportunity for education at the bedside. These were all very forward looking. And in fact, today's medical schools incorporate all of them. Um, at the time they were, they were brand new. Um, so they have, Elizabeth and Emily have, have, have culminated their, their work together, um, their professional work with the, with the founding of this college. Personally, their lives were equally interesting. Um, both sisters adopted daughters. Um, Emily Blackwell lived with her partner, a fellow surgeon named Elizabeth Cushier for the last several decades of her life. Um, two of their brothers married two of the most prominent feminists of the day, Lucy Stone, the uh, woman's suffrage advocate, and um, Antoinette Brown, who was the first woman in this country to be ordained as a minister. Um, interestingly, these two leaders of the women's rights movement were not people that Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell really agreed with at some levels. Um, the Blackwells did not believe that suffrage should be the first priority of the women's rights movement. Um, that's another complicating factor of this story that I find very interesting. Um, Elizabeth and Emily uh, were not on board with the women's rights movement in a lot of ways. Um, that's definitely a, a, an important piece of this book. Um, they disagreed with their, sis their sisters-in-law and they disagreed with each other too. So even though they had built the infirmary and the women's medical college together, um, they just, Elizabeth and Emily disagreed with each other about what role a woman doctor should take. Um, Elizabeth, as I said, was more interested in public health. 
she thought that a woman doctor was ideally a teacher armed with science. Um, Emily wanted to be a physician as skilled as any man. She wanted to be a practitioner and a surgeon and a professor uh, at the same level as her male colleagues. Um, so they disagreed about this. And after the foundation of their women's medical college, they parted ways with, I think, some relief and spent their last four decades of life on two different continents. Elizabeth returned to England, where she had always wanted to be, uh, and pursued moral reform and did a lot of publishing and speaking. Emily remained in New York and led the infirmary and college that they had founded for decades, so successfully in some ways that um, she basically sustained her pioneering sister's reputation at the expense of her own. Because today, if you've heard of Blackwell at all, it's only in the context of Elizabeth. Um, so that's the outline of the story. Um, this moment feels like a particularly relevant moment for, um, for, for female leaders who aren't necessarily um, uh, without flaw. I think it's really important to focus on that. And this photo I like to end with uh, kind of sums up why I think this story is important. If you Google Elizabeth Blackwell and you go to images, this image always comes up. I have seen it uh, alongside articles, documentary films. I've seen it on the jacket of at least one Blackwell biography. Um, it's a lovely um, photograph of a young woman who seems to be gazing into her future. Um, this is not a picture of Elizabeth Blackwell. How do you know? Well, if you flip it over, sorry, someone else is, there we go. Um, if you flip it over, there we go. Um, you see on the back that it was taken at Dana's Photo Portrait Gallery at 14th Street and 6th Avenue, uh, which did not exist until the mid 1880s. And no matter how well preserved, this is not the face of a woman in her 60s as Elizabeth Blackwell would have been then. So what happened? Why is this photo always misattributed? Um, um, well, if you look at the back, sorry, there we go. Um, the story is right there. Somebody wrote Bessie Blackwell at the top of the back of the photo. I think because this is one of Elizabeth Blackwell's nieces and that was her nickname. Somebody else trying to be helpful wrote, oh, Elizabeth Blackwell, right, 1821, 1910, that was the first woman doctor of modern times, yeah. Um, and that's how it was cataloged at the Museum of the City of New York. Down below, somebody has caught the mistake, probably not since Dana is at 14th Street address circa 1885. So it's right there on the photo itself that this is not Elizabeth Blackwell. Why does it keep being misattributed? Well, I think it's because this is how we like our female icons to look. We like them to be pretty and perky. We like them to have sort of a Disney princess, um, spunky moxie. Um, and we don't really want them to look like this. When, when, you, when you're faced with a choice of photo, you don't choose these. And I think that's a mistake. Um, the Blackwell sisters were not perky or pretty. They were not interested in pleasing anyone. Um, they were complicated and prickly and very real trailblazers. Um, and they're the kind of women who change the world. So that is their story. And I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Nimura. That was a fantastic, uh, a very engaging talk on a, on a very multidisciplinary uh, subject. I mean, it appeals, I think, on, on so many meaningful levels, uh, not just historically and, and with a local connection, but um, yeah, absolutely. So let's uh, let's open it up. Either um, type your comment in the uh, the chat box and I'll read it, or you can just unmute your microphone. You don't need to, to raise your hand and uh, pose your question directly to Ms. Namira. I have a comment. That was one of the most interesting things I think I have heard in the last 20 years. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> no, it really was. It was just so informative. And I love it when we go to Dansville and we see that, you know, it was the home of Florence Nighting Nightingale. And to hear that these two ladies were acquaintances and wrote letters back and forth. That was really interesting, too. So thank you very much for that. That was right. very, very, very interesting. Great. I think you meant Clara Barton there, but 
Yeah, I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> now I feel kind of like a, a turkey, but yeah. So anyway, still though, Florence Nightingale and and this Elizabeth was still a pretty interesting thing. But yeah, you're right. It was Clara Barton. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> So, I thought I saw someone else with their hand up. You can go ahead and chime in. Otherwise, there are some questions in the chat. Did the sisters have any children of their own? So, as I mentioned, none of the Blackwell sisters, none of the five Blackwell sisters ever married. Um, both Emily and Elizabeth ended up adopting daughters. Uh, in very different ways that I think sum up in some ways the differences between the two sisters. Um, Elizabeth adopted a little girl essentially as a companion. Uh, she was lonely and uh, did not had no interest in a husband, but didn't really have any interest in being by herself either. So she adopted a little girl named Kitty from Ireland. Um, she was an Irish orphan in New York and raised her to sort of be her companion interestingly, for a woman who uh, staked her life on proving what women could do, she did not really let Kitty uh, marry or pursue a career of her own. Kitty was there to um, be Elizabeth Blackwell's companion. Uh, and she called her Dr. Elizabeth. She did not call her mom. Um, Emily had a more sort of recognizably familial life where she uh, this is just after Elizabeth had left to go back to England and Emily was running things on her own, I think rather tellingly kind of set up her own family life, um, adopted a baby uh, who called her mom and signed her letters with kisses and, and got married and grew up and, and gave her grandchildren um, a, a more kind of recognizably maternal um, way of being. But uh, the, the none of the Blackwell sisters had any children of their own. As a historian, I'm fascinated by the encounter between Elizabeth and and uh, Florence Nightingale. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. Certainly. Um, is in, in Florence Nightingale's uh, highly literate, uh, prolific uh, correspondent, um, do, do we have a lot of insight that she's provided on her encounters with Elizabeth and possibly how she might, Elizabeth might have inspired her because I gather this, this was before she went off to the Crimea uh, and became the lady of the, with the lamp. Right. Exactly. Right. There is, I mean, and, and Elizabeth writes about it in her memoir. Um, the correspondence between them that survives is, is later than that. Um, but there's definitely some, um, diary entries that 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 Elizabeth records in her memoir of her visits with Florence. Well, you said that Elizabeth's degree would be more towards the Hold on. these days. Hold I'm on. sorry. Sorry, that was my wife. She was asking if Elizabeth's degree would be more um toward, more like a PA. Um, no, I Elizabeth uh, received this Elizabeth received the same medical MD degree that that any man did in 1849. Now, um, the, the degrees that men were receiving in 1849 would not have held water today. Um, That's what I think she was asking, if yeah. it was more along the lines of today's PA. Yeah, uh, it's hard to make that analogy. Um, it, it was at the time the most professional medical training that there was um, in, in, in the context of what we consider adequate medical training. It was nowhere. But then the state of medicine as a whole in in 21st century terms was nowhere. <laughs> so um, and who knows what 23rd century medicine will look like and how ridiculous we will seem now. Um, it's all a spectrum. So she apologized for interrupting. She didn't no, know how to do my microphone. <laughs> Not at all. It's a good question. <laughs> I see in the chat that someone is asking about whether Elizabeth apprenticed at an apothecary in Asheville, and I'm just cracking up about that because um, Elizabeth Blackwell did spend a little bit of time in the Carolinas um, teaching and trying to scrape together a little bit of medical knowledge by um, by befriending doctors who would let her read their medical libraries, but mostly she was just teaching and she was in Asheville for a bit. And there's a plaque in Asheville that commemorates her moment in the city, which was like less than a year. Um, 
And it's so funny because the, the plaque must be in, an, I don't know if anybody knows Asheville, but that plaque must be in a very prominent place because I can't tell you how many people I know who send me pictures of that plaque going, look, I'm in Asheville and there's a plaque about Elizabeth Blackwell here. So yes, there is a, there's a, she, Asheville has a cameo in this story. I did have a question though. Um, you said that the Blackwell sisters weren't really involved with the current movement of the, of the feminist during their time period, would they still be considered feminists, even though they didn't align with the the suffering? Like, I get the suffering part. Like, they wanted to show that women were strong and capable, not the woe is me, feel bad for me, that the feminist movement was trying to go in, kind of going at. So were yeah. they still involved, though? So uh, just to clarify terms, um, it wasn't suffering, it was suffrage. Suffrage is, suffrage. is, is the vote. Um, is, 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 suffrage is the technical term for the vote. So the, the, the first priority of the women's rights movement in the 1840s, the Declaration of Sentiments that was signed in Seneca Falls, right near where, you know, where Elizabeth was at medical school, ironically, um, their top priority was for women to have the vote. Women's suffrage was the first goal of the women's rights movement. And that is where Elizabeth Blackwell disagreed with it, because she believed that if you gave the vote to women before you taught women that they could be the equal of men, that they would just vote how their husbands and fathers and brothers told them to, that giving them the vote would not be a powerful tool until they had the mentality to use it independently. Um, and that was her beef with the women's rights movement. She also wasn't much of a team player. Um, the, 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 um, the Seneca Falls, women's rights leaders wanted her to join them. They, what a poster child she was, right? Um, and they, they reached out to her and said, hey, you know, let, let's, let's march together. And she said, uh, uh, no, thank you. I'm not interested in being anyone's mascot. Um, she didn't have a very, um, a very positive view of other women. And that's another piece of the story that to me feels very modern. Um, there was a degree of female misogyny in here, this sort of, I'm doing it the hard way. I have no time for you if you are no, not as serious about this as I am. Um, and I think I think that feels all too familiar in a really dismaying way to today. So to your question about whether you could call her a feminist, um, different people have different definitions of feminism. If, if your definition of feminism is that women have the capacity to be the equals of men, then certainly she was a feminist. Um, if your idea, idea of a feminist is... Um, is someone who who prizes sisterhood and 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 lifts up other women, <laughs> um, then in some ways she was, and in some distinct ways she wasn't. Um, and that I think is why this this story interests me. I think the reason that it shows up on the children's shelf so often is that it's easier to tell this story as a children's story and leave out all the tricky things. Um, the tricky things to me are what makes it interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? What was the principal source of resistance to, ha to to allowing women into medical schools or within academia? I imagine it's a it's a constellation of factors. You know, understood traditional gender roles. The woman is a, should inhabit the domestic sphere, not the public. Um, also, as you articulated nicely, the, um, you know, the Victorian sensibility, you know, we don't want to expose women to blood and guts and even male genitalia. And I know that that, feature, you know, you discuss that in the book. Mm -hmm. Is there also a persistence of this notion that that women lack the intellectual aptitude that men per, were, were presumed to possess? Absolutely. And, yeah, that that and and that and that and that intense intellectual pursuit would be so debilitating to a woman that she would probably become ill and might not even be able to bear children, right? So you know this sort of um, dismaying uh, quasi-medical idea that um, that that intellectual labor would divert blood flow from you know the reproductive organs and make women less unable to fulfill their duties as wives and mothers. Um, there was a lot of pseudoscience around that throughout the 19th century. Um, and in fact, Mary Putnam Jacoby, who was another pioneering female physician who was somebody inspired by the Blackwell sisters and who worked alongside them, um, actually um, won a prize for her work on um, 
you know, uh, whether you really need to take to your bed when you are menstruating. This idea that 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 this is debilitating. She 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 took science and applied it, and and um, kind of put all of the men in their places. It's a it's a fun one to read. <laughs> <laughs> And there's there's a bunch of comments in the chat. Um, one, uh, what was your inspiration when you uh, went, you know, and, and when you um, decided to go into academia? And, okay. and I would add to that: does does Elizabeth remain a major inspiration for you? Well, Elizabeth wasn't an inspiration because I'd never heard of her when I went to college. Um, I I got there intending to be a doctor because I had always been better at math and science than anything else. Um, but I was also a bookworm. And when I got to college, I discovered that the English classes were just a whole lot more fun. So I was seduced by the humanities and ended up um, studying English literature. Um, I, she's an inspiration to me now just because um, I, I think uh, she's taught me a lot about um, the fact that women don't need to be nice to achieve things. I think um, at the risk of veering toward the political, I think this country got itself into a lot of trouble in the last decade by um, by turning their backs on female leaders because they weren't somebody they wanted to have a beer with. Um, I, I think that it's really important for us all to take a hard look at how we see powerful women um, and 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 you know what we what standards we hold them to. So in that way, she's definitely an inspiration. Yeah, so when is the film going to come out? I mean, this is, as you say, such a relevant, such an important, timely topic and such an inspiration. I mean, as you can see by the comments of, of the students here, this would make such a fantastic film. I I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was one other question here. Oh, somebody had asked if, if after Emily and Elizabeth parted ways, did they keep in touch? Um, they definitely did. Uh, they corresponded for the rest of their lives. They only saw each other a very small handful of times, though, uh, which I always found very interesting. I'm an only child. And another part of this story that attracted me is the sibling relationship. Um, you know, they, they they sustained each other and they also drove each other nuts. Um, and I think they also pushed against each other a great deal and defined each other in opposition to each other. Uh, those are all things that I found really interesting. Any other questions? We're, we're approaching the end of uh, of the scheduled period. We have time for another question or comment. I'm sure my humanities and English uh, colleagues who are here appreciated your previous comment <laughs> and would agree that uh, about uh, the how engage, how attractive English is as a in literature <laughs> as a as a subject. Well, I have a daughter who just graduated from college and as an English major and who is now heading to medical school. So. Um, I wish somebody had been around when I was facing that crossroads to tell me that you could do both. Um, I think we're better at that now. Right. And, and you're a testament to that because you've you've uh, uh, articulated in a magnificent uh, literary way the subject that you decided to focus on at the scholarly and professional level. And, and I'll reference, uh, I guess, in closing. Um, a comment made by Dr. Pierce, who's one of our history faculty and our local historian, who is provides a very strong endorsement to your book and a recommendation to everyone out here that hasn't yet read it. Um, he read the book a couple years ago. He actually had an extra copy that he gave me so that he, 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 this book obviously resonated with him. It is very readable, he writes. Several times I have found it hard to put down, and he recommends it to anyone looking for some recreational reading or professional reading. Uh, I thank you for that endorsement. My my goal is to write history for people who don't think they like to read it. So um, that's that's high praise. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming out to support Women's History Month. And uh, thanks to Janice for helping us to do it in such a compelling way. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I envy you your your historical home there. Thanks. And you've, Thanks so I'm much. gonna uh, have to modify my lecture on typhus fever now that I give in my medical history course because I was not aware of of Elizabeth's uh, work on that subject. That's right. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.